another top five list. Uh, this time, as the title of the slide says, or slide say, top five 8-bit computers, so microcomputers from the 70s and 80s. Um, this is probably going to be starting to get into some of those controversial topics, right? So, um, not quite ready to do, you know, editors yet. But uh, let's take a look, see at what I think my top five uh, 8-bit home computers are. Five is the BBC Micro. Um, never used one of these outside of emulation, but they were quite popular in uh, Britain. Um, again, BBC sort of had this relationship with them. They were used as part of a, you know, some educational television programming. Made by Acorn, um, really influential company. Uh, used the 6502. Had a good basic uh, language included. Four is the Commodore PET, one of that group from 77 of the kind of initial batch of, of real, uh, you know, more useful 8-bit uh, micros. So after things like the Altair and the Kim 1 that were a little more rough and ready, still great machines. Um, you have the Commodore PET. Um, I actually have used one of these. I like it because it had this great futuristic look. Um, you know, the included display, again, monochrome only, tape drive included, but you know it's all in one package. They're heavy, um, but it has this cool feature. You kind of lift up the uh, lift up the hood on it. Uh, the keyboard is absolutely atrocious. I know they they changed this in later um, later models of the PET. And it had a very early Commodore BASIC, which I believe, if I recall correctly, was actually a Microsoft BASIC um, that they paid, I think Commodore, I think the story is they paid $25,000 to Microsoft for the rights to use Microsoft's BASIC, you know, perpetually um, in all their systems. So a great deal on that. The Commodore PET um, didn't really get the foothold in education. It was probably should have had um you know and in many ways the apple uh two got that uh got that foothold in education not to say there weren't pets in schools um but great machine again 6502 uh processor um but the uh, this is one of those uh, original batches of uh of home computers so here is the big one right and number three we've got the commodore 64 uh, the classic, and this one is from the early 80s, so a little bit later on. Uh, and this is showing the the bread box model here um, with the new logo, so kind of a middle era, middle era model. Um, the earlier ones had a different uh, logo stripe on them, and uh, you know, slightly different function key color. But this is kind of the classic um, C64, you know, form factor. They made later ones. The C64C looked a little different, kind of whitish, more white color than this brown. But this was an amazing machine. One, because of its price. Um, you know, at, at some point you could get them very inexpensively. Uh, two, because of the graphics and sound capabilities included here. Um, it had the, the SID audio chip, which is still used by musicians today. Um, a great little synthesizer. So you got three oscillators, you have some filters, a fantastic sound. So this is, this is kind of one of the best kind of sound synthesizer chips of any um, any computer um, you know did it could it accurately recreate music like we can today no but it had a sound and it was very capable uh, it also had the uh, the VIC 2 chip uh, which was for for video so you get sprite capabilities background and you know, decent amount of colors again for an 8-bit home computer pretty impressive the downsides were it was a 40 column only display and the the drive axis, so you'd pair it with a, a 1541 uh, drive. It's pretty slow compared to its competitors. Um, you could also, of course, attach a cassette tape, which is even slower. And uh, it was decently expandable. But inexpensive home computer, really nice. Two, we have the MSI 8080. And I debated for a while to put on this list to put the, the Altair which was really kind of the first popular computer, right? So again, one of these basic, hey, it's an 8080 from Intel. 
you get front panel switches um, to do the basic input and output without any expansion. Obviously you could add terminals, you could add disk drives, all sorts of stuff. Um, the MSI 8080 was almost identical to the Altair, kind of a clone, if you will. Um, and this was again, 70 zero. Machine. I just, one, like the look of the MSI a lot better. The, you know, the yellow, uh, the, the colored red and, and blue switches, fantastic. Plus, you know, it was in some ways had a, you know, a supporting cast role in the, the great film War Games from the early 80s. So if you haven't seen that movie, check it out. Um, it, it's a lot of fun. Um, but, I mean, this just looks fantastic. Um, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't grab an image I should have with the, you know, front panel lights going. And, uh, but it just has such wonderful lines. Um, I've never used an MSI 8080. I have used 8080-based machines. Um, and this ran CPM, so it was, uh, you know, not as, say, simple to use as something like a Commodore 64. You had CPM, which, you know, had had some quirks, especially in the CPM1 days. Um, by the time it got a little later on, it was it was better, and CPM was a, a great operating system. Um, you know, a lot of DOS was based on, on CPM. CPM was, was ubiquitous in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, on the... Intel 8080, 8085, and Xilog Z80 type machines. They all ran CPM. Uh, the 6502 ones, I think there was a CPM for 6502. Uh, can't be sure. But it was really popular on the, the Intel 8080 and the Xilog Z80 machines. Uh, and this had the S100 bus. So an early kind of expansion bus where you could get all sorts of stuff. You know, memory cards, graphics, uh, display adapters, um, your storage interfaces. Uh, so this was a, a full full featured machine. I mean, this would be, in many ways, this is kind of a scaled down mini computer. Uh, you know, had the same sort of thing. So front panel input to do bootstrapping, expandability on a bus, um, which some of the other home computers didn't have. Take a moment now to talk about a couple honorable mentions and, and things that aren't on the list. And this is maybe where it's going to get a little controversial. None of the stuff from Apple is going on here. Um, you know, the, the Apple II series, it was a 6502, and absolutely nothing wrong with the design, especially considering it was designed by one guy. Excellent design there. But it didn't offer any advantages over, say, a Commodore PET. Um, or later on, say, the Apple IIe versus a Commodore 64. The Commodore 64 had graphics and sound capabilities that well outstripped the Apple II and it was a fraction of the price. So this is something Apple still does today, which is provide their stuff at a, you know, it, it's it's overpriced for what you get. I mean, talk about recent Macs, back before they switched to Intel, there was sort of a justification for the higher price. You know, you got a real CPU, right? So you got a G5 or something, um, you know, from the Power series. Um, now you just get a, you know, bog standard Intel CPU what's the difference really right so maybe they have slightly higher integration of components but not really uh, as people have proven with your your hackintosh you can hack up a the equivalent of a mac pro for a fraction of the price um, in a better looking case um, and with better specs so yeah didn't include apple uh, some of the other ones that didn't include were things like the cosmac elf some some really oddball things um, the Sinclair line I didn't include either. Um, they were low cost, but they were also very limited. Um, and if you want to talk about, uh, you know, uh, home computers from England, I think the BBC Micro was, was better, um, in, in almost all regards. Um, or I guess that would be the Acorn, whatever the model is. Uh, interesting film about those worth checking out, uh, it's called Micro Men, um, which has some of the, the Clive Sinclair and then the guy who uh, founded Acorn. So some good stories there. So uh, I'm trying to think of anything else that should have made the list that didn't. The Kim one, which was the early 6502 kind of Chuck Pedals, you know, demo board for, for, for modern parlance what it was. Uh, but again, pretty limited. So let's go down to the, the number one here, the Commodore 128. This is actually a machine that I still use on a regular basis. And why is it such, why is it kind of the king of the 8-bit home computers? 
it was nearly fully compatible with Commodore 64. So I've yet to find any software in, in my library that does not run on 128 in 64 mode. So it had the C64 ROMs um, included, so you'd, you'd hold down uh, a, a key while you were booting up, and it would boot into Commodore 64 mode. Or you could also enter C64 mode from the, the basic shell. And again, I have not found anything that's not compatible, any of the Commodore 64 software. So you had C64 capabilities, so, you know, SID, VICT2, um, but then you also had Commodore 128, so it ran twice as fast as C64. You got an 80-column display, which is really nice if you're doing any actual work, if you're not playing games. Um, the 80-column display was a little bit limited in terms of color. You know, you didn't have sprites, things like that. It's a really more business-oriented display, but, you know, par for the course for a lot of those displays there. So you had your basic C64 mode, you had the 128 mode, so you got more memory, you got 80 column display, uh, faster processor, and then you also had a Z80 thrown in there, and you could run CPM on this. So you had this huge software catalog, and again, maybe it was a little bit late for CPM, but CPM software, you know, you have to remember in, you know, say 1985, there was still a good amount of CPM software out there. Uh, we, we think about it today, about how uh, you know, computers get refreshed very quickly, things go obsolete very quickly. But back in the 80s, there wasn't a whole lot of difference. If you got your Commodore 64, say, in, you know, the early 80s, it was still viable for playing games, writing documents, etc., you know, up until maybe the early 90s, for, for most home users. So you really had kind of an 8 or 10 year lifespan for a lot of these machines. Um, and even today, people still use their Commodore 64s. I use my 128. Um, you know, it, it, it functions great. I mean, I use it for playing Commodore 64 games and for writing, you know, software. And, you know, play software, right? No one's actually, uh, no one actually wants to run that stuff other than me. But there wasn't the same refresh cycle. So this being kind of at the, the last of these, and this was out at the same time as the early Amigas, and it was just such a... It, you know, it's a beautiful looking machine here in the, the standard uh, 128 model. Uh, they also had a couple of other models that separated the keyboard and included a drive. Uh, drive access was also fixed and you had uh, a better drive. You had a what was called the 1571 drive. So a better drive, uh, you know, double sided uh, drive. The, the 1541s, the earlier Commodore drives were single sided. But you could still use the tape interface. Uh, a lot of the peripherals were shared. You could certainly use an earlier uh, Commodore drive with uh, with the 128, um, and it just it, it it functioned. It did have a couple flaws um, compared to the earlier 64. Is they had a you know kind of a, a slight tweak on the SID chip, so the more modern SID chips in the 128 didn't quite sound as nice as the early C64 SID chips to some ears. Right, so there was the little bit of things. This had a, a, an updated version of that. Um, it also came with BASIC 7, if I believe, right? It should be BASIC 7. So you got a lot of extra primitives. It had a, a little uh, machine language monitor. So this was your complete package. If you wanted an 8-bit home machine, um, this was kind of the, the last 8-bit you know, home computer and had everything you could possibly want. Um, and one, I mean, just look at the keyboard. It has a numeric keypad. Um, it has real arrow keys, although they're in the wrong place, if you see. Um, not much else to say about that. But please leave comments below um, and discuss this a little bit. I mean, I'd be interested to hear what your opinions are on on your favorite micros from the 80s. Um, and also, if you if you like this, maybe uh, maybe we do another one on say mini computers. I mean those are in some ways more interesting interesting to me now than the micros were. Well thanks and please comment below uh, with your own thoughts.